We welcome you all and Benny. So Okay. Good afternoon guys. We've got quite a turnout. That was unex unexpected. My name is Benny Swart and I'm going to speaking going to be speaking on row level security. Um, this is something that was introduced in Postgres 9.5 uh, quite a while ago, but many people still don't know how to use it. It's the school thing, but they don't know how to use it. There's quite a lot of stuff I want to show you, so I'm going to be going uh, fast, but it's not difficult to follow, so just try and keep focused. I really want to show you the stuff at the end, especially, and then if, there's, if we take the question time as well, I'll stay afterwards and you can ask questions. Okay, we're going to be doing a quick recap on Postgres roles and privileges, really uh, basic stuff. And then we're going to dive straight into row uh, security policies, which is also known as uh, row level security. Um, and then we're going to look at database users versus application users. And I think this is something that most of us work with, with every day, um, I would suspect. And then we're going to look at how do we use row level security to improve the access control when we are using application users. And then the thing I really want to get to is this last one. Um, it's a problem that I think most of you have encountered. Um, you do a lot of boilerplate access control in your application. And it's stuff that you do over and over and over and over again. And you make mistakes. If you go on the website, if you go on the internet and you find any random website and you find a vulnerability, the chances are it's in the application code and not something that's improperly set up in the DB. So, I've been playing with something that I think is going to solve that problem. It's a work in progress. It could be completely wrong. Hopefully some of you can, can give me feedback on that, but it works. It looks like it, like it works, at least. Okay, let's dive in. Postgres roles. You get users and you get groups, and then users can be part of groups, and groups can also be part of groups. But internally, in Postgres, everything is a role. A user is simply a role that can log in. A group is a role that cannot log in. And Postgres roles, in other words, database uh, users, are distinct from operating system users. There's no correlation, although you can set it up that way, but it's not uh, necessary. As I said, roles can be members of other roles. This allows any role to become another role and then assume the privileges of that role, or you can inherit the privileges of all roles you are a part of automatically. Two different ways to do it. And then when you uh, connect to the Postgres DB, you start your connection, you obviously log in, and the role that you choose to log in with, which is your user, will be stored in the session user variable. And then whenever you change roles, the role that you are currently acting as is going to be stored in the current user. And whenever you execute reset role, current user is going to re revert back to session user. <coughs> and then there's also this implied public role that all uh, roles implicitly inherit from. Okay, let's get into some examples. Log into the DB, create a, ro a role user one that can log in, that inherits the privileges of all its uh, parent roles. Create another role, user two. This is just the stuff that we're going to be uh, using for testing. So I'm just take note of this. We're going to use it a lot. Create another user that can also log in, but it does not automatically inherit the privileges of its parent roles. Create a role admin that cannot log in. Make user one a part of admin. Make user two a part of admin. And then we create a schema test that we'll be using throughout the talk. And then we grant all privileges on test to admin. Note, it's not granted to the, to the users, it's granted to admin. And then if, if we see uh, what we've done so far, we've got admin, cannot log in. User 1, can log in, member of admin. User 2, does not, does not uh, automatically inherit privileges from admin. But it's, it's a member of admin. Okay. So, we try to log in using admin. Can't do that because admin is set as no login. It's a group, not a user. Login us using user one. And there you can see the session user and the current user is both user one. We create a table, test.table u1. 
and we change role to admin. We can do that because we are part of admin. And there you can see what's changed. We're still logged in originally as user one, but we've assumed admin. And then we create a table, test.table A1 for admin. And just to see what we've done, there's test.table A1, which is owned by admin because we were admin when we created it. And there's test.table U1, which is owned by user1 because we were user1 when we created it. But user1 doesn't have privileges on test, on schema test, but we assume the privileges of admin so we could create that table. Okay, log in, log in, uh, log out, log in with user two. Create a table test dot table u two. We can't do that because user two does not automatically assume the privileges of admin, so it doesn't have rights for for the admin or uh, for the test schema. Change role to admin. Do it again. Now it works. So user two cannot do that, but admin can. And just to see what we've done so far. You can see the additional table that's been created, table A2, created by admin. We can also select from table A1, which we didn't create, but we are admin now, and this was created by admin, so we can do that. But we cannot select from U1, because we, as admin, are not a, a, a part of user1. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Really basic stuff. Reset role. Select from table A1. You can see it's the same query as we did there, but this time it doesn't work because we reverted back to user 1. We are no longer admin. Okay, recapping Postgres privileges. In order to perform any command, you need uh, on, uh, any command on an object, you need privileges to do so. That's what privileges are from the docs. When an object is created, it is assigned an owner. The owner is normally the role that executed the creation statement. For most kinds of objects, the initial state is that only the owner or a super user can do anything with the object. To allow other roles to use it, privileges must be granted. We saw that with the test schema. You do the grant and revoking using grant and revoke, and then grants are checked using or. So if you are granted 100 different kinds of grants on lots of tables, then, and you execute a specific command on a specific table, any one of those grants, if any one of those grants satisfy the, the requirements, you can do it. So um, this is also required for later from the docs. Postgres grants default privileges on, on some types of objects to public. And remember, all roles implicitly inherit from public. No privileges are granted to public by default on tables, table columns, sequences, and, and other stuff. Um, but, and what's important here is that by default, you have execute privileges for functions. So that's just, and, and usage for uh, languages and data types. So that's just some Postgres defaults. Uh, you can override it, of course. Right, for tables and views, you can create, you can grant for select, for insert, for update and delete, and a whole range of other stuff. And these commands are grantable on the, on the table as a whole, or you can grant them per column. So you can actually give a user grants or, or privileges only to, uh, to select from one column of a table, or two or three, or, or the whole table. Same for insert or update. For functions, you can either execute it or you cannot. And then there's, uh, when you create a function and you define it as security invoker, it means that when a user executes this function, the function will run as the user that invoked it. If you define it using this, the function will run as the user that defined it. Okay, this is also important for later. So it's like the, the S flag on, on Linux, I think. Right, we log in, and we assume user one. Then, just to illustrate how this permission stuff works, we create a table test.rainfall, we have an ID, a day, and the milliliters of rain. Then we grant select on the last two columns, insert on only the milliliters, and update on only the milliliters to admin. We change role to admin, and then we try and insert into day and milliliters these values. But we can't because we only have privileges to insert into milliliters. So 
get an error there. If we only try and insert into milliliters, we get an unexpected error here, which says that we don't have um, permission to use this sequence we've created over there. So you actually need to explicitly grant usage on the sequence as well. So let's just do that quickly. Go back to user one, grant usage on that sequence to admin, and go back to admin and do the same query again. Insert into only milliliters that value, and it works. One row inserted. Try and select out what we just inserted. We can't do that because we don't have select privileges for ID, if, we, if you can remember. Now let's select only the last two columns. And now all of a sudden it works because we've got privileges. Try and update setting the milliliters where ID equals 1. We've got privileges to do that, to update that. Questions at the end, please. Um, but to do this where uh, uh, clause, you actually need to select to, to check that value. And we don't have select privileges on ID. So that's why this fails. But if we change that condition and we look on the day, which we have privileges for, it passes this time. Then obviously we, don't, we never granted delete, so we can't do that. Go back to user 1. Create a function, select as yourself, which selects all the data from test.rainfall and its security invoker. So if you call it, it runs as you. And then create exactly the same function, select as user 1, but this time it's defined as security definer. So whoever calls it doesn't matter, it will always run as user 1. Go back to admin. And then select star from select as yourself. So we are trying to select all the data from the table as ourself. Can't do that, as expected. Now we only select the two fields that we can from the same function. But why does it fail? Because this function internally executes that first. And it tries to select the ID. And at that stage, it's failed. It never even got there. So that fails as well. But then if we select star from select as user 1, same query but this function executes as user 1, and user 1 has permissions to do that. So that just illustrates the security invoker versus security definer. OK, that lays the groundwork. Let's get into the row-level security. Row-level security, surprisingly enough, controls which rows can be read or modified, whereas the SQL, def the default privilege system, controls which columns can be read and modified. That's how the command's defined. So you can see from that that policies are created on a table for a certain command, optionally, to a certain role, optionally, and then using and with check we'll get to now. What using means is that we can only operate on rows where whatever this expression is evaluates to true. When that expression evaluates to false, the rows are essentially hidden uh, as if they never existed. So we, we don't get an error. The row is just not there. With check, what that does is that's when you write the data. So when you insert or update, this executes. When it uh, evaluates to true, that means your data can go in. It's fine. When it's false, an error is thrown because you're trying to insert invalid data. Then row-level security must be explicitly enabled on a table using alter table enable row-level security. It has a default deny policy. So once row-level security is enabled, everything's hidden. You have to explicitly grant policies or create policies. Um, and when you try to select something or insert something, the policy must pass. And then you can, uh, then you can execute the command. So, I have to show these two together, it's a bit confusing. <coughs> Policies for the same command, types for the same command, are checked using all. So if you're trying to insert, and there are multiple insert policies, if you pass any one of them, you're good to go. So it's all. But if you're trying to, to write and select, so update where, update is a write, where is a select, you have to pass one of the updates and one of the selects. So it's or in this group, and uh, or in this group. Does that make sense? Okay. Only table owners can create policies. 
super users and users with the bypass RLS flag will always bypass relative security. Table owners bypass it by default. This can be changed by using alter table force row level security. Okay, let's take a look. Login, assume user one, and then create test dot message. Its message has an ID, a timestamp when it was sent, who it was sent from, who it was sent to, and the message body. Okay. We grant privileges on test dot message to admin. And we learned from our mistake last time, we grant usage on the sequence. And then we say, right, enable row level security for this table. And we create our first policy. The policy, the, the goal of the policy is to ensure current users. So what this does is when you select a row, it checks that you, the current user, are either the one that sent it or the one that it was sent to. So you cannot see messages that don't concern you. And then with check, whenever you try to write here, you can only write stuff from yourself. You can't cheat by sending something as if you were someone else. So that's what that policy does. Okay, so we insert um, uh, our first message here. We say it's from user one to user two, saying hello. No problem there. And then we insert another message from user 2 to admin. And there's no error, but why? That's because by default the owner is not subject to row level security. We created this as user 1 and we're still logged in as user 1. So row level security did not kick in at this point. So let's change that. Ah, oh, okay, well, this is how the table looks currently. You can see that this, this message doesn't concern us, but somehow we still can see it. Let's force row level security for the owner as well. Do the same thing. Now that message is gone. We can only see the ones that concern us. Now we insert another message that's not from us, and now we get told, no, you can't do that. Let's change role to admin. Insert a message that's from us, so that's fine. That works. And as we select star from test.message. And you can see here by the IDs, the first ID is the one that, was, that does not concern admin. Two is one that concerns us. Three was burned by the, by the error. And four is the one that we just inserted here. So we can only see messages that have admin as recipient or sender. Now let's update. Set the user, <coughs> update this message sent from user one. Can't do that because that's not us. And the policy prevents us. So we try it again. We, on this message, we say uh, <coughs> update and set that to admin. Now, it doesn't make sense, really. Oh, actually, I, I, I fooled myself here. The problem here is that you can't actually see that. So it succeeds, but nothing was updated. So you, say, you, can have, you could have said that where ID is 5,000, and the same thing, because to you it doesn't exist. Because that first row that was over there with ID 1 doesn't concern you. Does that make sense? Okay. Now insert another, me insert another message. What was I trying to say? Uh, oh, we explicitly select uh, all the messages where user one is concerned. And as you can see, we can only see this message that we just inserted here. But that was to user one. But the one with ID one that was from user one, we still can't see because we, are not, we aren't part of that message. OK, reset role. So we're the Postgres user again. Select all the messages, and it works. Why? Because super users aren't subject to row level security. As you can see there. That's because of the reset role that we reverted back to our session user. Let's go back to user one. 
and there you can see we can we only get the messages that concern us this time around. Now remember we're the owner, user one is the owner. So we drop the policy. Now let's get into some censoring because that seems to be the theme of our era. So we create a table, censored messages, and we insert that, that only takes the message ID that you want to censor. We say we're going to censor mes message one. And then we recreate this policy. We say ensure current user and censor. So same thing here, you can only select the rows that concern you, but also that are not being censored. And then the same check applies there. The point of this is just to show you that in, in this expression you can reference other tables as well. So select star from test.message and there you can see we only get ID5 because ID1 has been censored. Okay. Database users versus application users. This whole thing with Postgres, user 1, user 2 and admin, that was all database users. That's the default. But what you typically have, for example, with the website is you, your backend connects to your DB using, using a, a database user like web or API or whatever you want to call it. And then you've got hundreds or thousands of application users um, that you multiplex over this connection. And you, you typically have your own table that you created to store the data for your application users. So you can do this in two ways. Let me just hide that quickly. You can say, you can use database users where you connect with the user that you are servicing the request for. And for the duration of that connection, you stay that user. Or you can connect with some generic user like web. And then you can assume the role of the user that you're servicing the request for. Or you connect with some um, set user like web or API. And then you, your application needs to to um, ensure that you only execute que queries that the user you are servicing for has permissions for. Like if, you're, if your user is PT, you don't want him to access the admin stuff or, or whatever. So this is how websites are typically, typically done, using that. We'll see how that compares. So when using database users, your users are stored there. I think that's where I narrowed it down to. Could be wrong, but they were there when I checked. Um, when you use application users, you can store them basically anywhere. Any schema, any table. Your DB connections, in this case, because you only, you, you only have one user on the connection, you need to make a new connection for, ev for every user that you're servicing. This way, you can have one connection, and then you just use set role to assume the role of the user that you're servicing. This way, also one connection, and then your application is responsible for executing the right queries over that connection. I forgot to explain the green stuff. This is more flexible. So if we ever want to design our own thing, this would be preferable. And when we compare the connections, the fewer connections we are forced to make, the better. So these two cases would be more preferable than that case. And then this is a big one. If your application got compromised and the user is able to execute arbitrary SQL code, then the only one of these three uh, methods of doing that would still secure your data is this one, if your DB is set up correctly. If you use set role, then whoever's compromised your application can just set role to anything. And using application users, you can just execute any uh, arbitrary code. Does that make sense still? So this is the problem that most websites have. You find a SQL injection uh, somewhere, and you can just execute anything. Because the DB isn't uh, protected. It, it trusts your application, and that's a problem. So that's definitely a, a big point we want to focus on. Then user scope. If you do it this way, your users are global across your database cluster. And if you use application users, it's really up to you. It's typically local to your database or to your schema. And we want to stay away from global stuff, so, so this is preferable. And then let's say you want to dynamically assign permissions to your users. So we can make this guy admin from our web interface or something. Then you can actually 
do that, whatever um, scheme you're using here. So you can, if you're using uh, applica DB users, you can just um, make that user a part of the role that has that permissions. And if you're using application users, well, it's really up to you how you control the access. So that's also easy. So both of those methods will work. We, we're going to use this in a moment. So let's see how it's typically done using application users. The user comes to your website, he logs in. So he does a request to slash login, and he sends a username and a password. Your application constructs the SQL queries that you will use to fetch the user and also fetch his permissions from the database. Your database just says, OK, I trust you. I'm going to execute it. I'm going to return the result. The application says, if we can find that user with that password, create a session, return the session ID, otherwise return error. Okay, this is pretty standard. And then the, the browser says, if we don't have an error, store the session for use that in all future requests. Okay, standard. And then after off you've logged in, you start using the website. So any API endpoint here, you send your session ID to identify you and whatever parameters you require. The application validates your session ID, checks the permissions for that endpoint, and if that's not valid or you have insufficient permissions, it's up to the application to raise an error. And then it decides what to do and it constructs those queries. Sends it to the database. Database says, OK, execute, return. Application returns. And the browser uses the result. So over here, you can have one application running, so one web server, and you can have multiple users interfacing with it simultaneously. And over here, you typically have a single database user that you are using to connect to your database. And this user has the sum of all the application user's privileges. So whatever application user you are acting as, this database user must be able to do that thing. So this typically has much more privileges than a typical user would need. And that's a problem. Once you compromise this, you have all the privileges of this. That's a problem. And your database is indiscriminate. It doesn't really care what's going on. It just says, I trust you, application. I will do whatever you say. So access control really is only done here when you log in once. And for every single time that an API endpoint is hit, this process or something similar repeats. How many times? How many API endpoints you have? And this is where access control is done. The problem here is that this repeats many times. And you can have exceptions. Uh, so th in this case, handle it this way, handle it that way. And you make mistakes, yeah. Or, or you just don't know. And then that's vulnerable. Even, even advanced users can, can make mistakes. Something slips your mind. So how can we improve that using row-level security? Well, in an ideal world, what would we want? We would want a custom user table. That's the, that green stuff we just highlighted. One database connection. Definitely, we want to be secure from vulnerable application code. So we want the database to perform as much access control as possible. We want our users to be local to the database. We don't want to pollute the global namespace. So you can have two applications running in the same DB, and the usernames are reusable. And we want to easily manage dynamic permissions. But for the, for the database to, to, to perform um, access control, it needs to know what application user it's currently dealing with. It knows the DB user, but that, that's really irrelevant. It needs to know the application user. So how do we tell it? The naive solution would be to store some kind of identification, ex example, your user ID in a session variable. But if, you, if an attacker executes arbitrary code, you can just change that to the ID of admin. So how do we know that that value can be trusted? Two possible solutions. There's a great article here at Second Quadrant that you guys can go and read. Just Google role level security Second Quadrant. We can use security definer functions to sign and validate the variable using a secret key. A secret key that only the super user would have access to, but because the function is security definer, it would have access to that. Then we can sign that, that session variable, and each time it's checked, it's used, we can check it first. So even if you compromise the application, and you change it, 
uh, the, the, the signature verification will fail. The second method is to, once you successfully authenticate, we create an unguessable session ID, just like random, but properly random, uh, which is stored in the, the variable. And this is the method that I'll show you guys. So we log in, we say create extension PG crypto, that's just to handle the, the password hashing, and create a schema core, this is where we're going to do our core stuff. And then we create our user table, each user has an ID, a username, and a password. And we create session with an ID, a user ID for that session, and the unique token. <clears throat> that's properly random, unguessable. Okay, the next five slides are going to define the utility functions that we're going to use, but afterwards I'm going to summarize it. So if you get lost, just hold on. We define a get auth function. That returns, it looks in the setting and returns the token that we currently uh, authenticated by. That, that identifies the session. Similarly, I'm going to skip that. Oh, can't. We create a set auth function that just does the inverse. It sets the authentication token in that uh, session setting. Okay. Next, we create a function token to user. So it takes a token, looks it up in the session table. If it's valid, returns the corresponding user ID. Okay. I'm just going to skip that. And then another function that returns the currently logged in user. So this would get the current authentication token. If the token is null, so you've not logged in, return null. Else execute token to user. So return the user that we logged in as. Next, create a function that hashes the password. Don't really need to go into that. And then a function that logs in creating a new session. So you give it your username and your password. Then it goes and it says, look up in my user table where the username is this. If there's no such user or the passwords don't match, return invalid or raise invalid login. Otherwise, create a new session and store it in the session table and set the, the setting. And notice this is security definer. So only these, these functions have access to that user table and session table but whoever's executing them does not necessarily have to have those permissions. And that's why this works and is secure. Another login function, but this time it's to continue a session that you already have created. And then just a function to log out. So to summarize, that's what we've created. What we're going to use is login, login using username and password to create a new session. Login to continue a existing session, a function to, to get the current user that's logged in, and a function to log out. And as you have noticed, we store the session in that variable. I'll show you how this is secured in a second. Right, let's create two users, app user one with the password, app user two with the password. And we say, Enable role level security on that user table. Create a role API that can log in, and this is what we will use from our ap application to connect to the DB. Uh, give it where did I create the schema? Oh, it's already created. Okay, give API uh, access to that core schema so that it can execute the functions we've just defined. That's why I do that. And then we also grant select on core.user to API. Right, let's create the policy. This isn't really practical necessarily, but it illustrates the concept. We say uh, create a policy that ensures that you can only ever select your own user from the user table. So you can't see other users' details. We assume the role of the API user, and then we select start from core user, And we see nothing. Why? Because we haven't logged in yet. So we, we aren't that user. We aren't that user, so we see nothing. Okay? Let's log in. Oh, well, 
in a second. We will log in. So just to confirm, current user is null. True. We haven't logged in yet. Let's log in. App user one with the wrong password. We get an error. Log in app user one with the correct password. That's our session token that's been created. We can verify that we are currently logged in as user with ID one. And then select star from user. This time we are that user and we can see the corresponding row and none of the other rows. Let's log in as app user two. Select star again. This time we only see user two. Now let's try to hack it. So we generate a random token here that we are guessing. We store it in that variable. Remember, we, are, we, we just logged in, so we're still logged in, but we changed the token. And we say select core.current user. Who are we? And it says, I don't know who you are. That token doesn't exist. So that's how this whole thing is secure. Log out. Confirm. Yes. We, the current user is null. Okay, this is the part I really wanted to get to. I don't know if we're going to have time. Um, this is the, th the thing that I've been playing with. Let's see how far we get. Okay, so how can we move all access control into the database? Like everything. Is it possible to move everything into the database? The default privilege system gives us access, to, controls access to columns based on database users. Using row-level security, we can control access to rows based on expressions, and we can use this for application users. So the question is, is it possible to control access to columns based on application users? How about controlling access to individual cells? Is that possible? Let's say that for the user table, you want to allow anyone to select from ID or username but only allow selecting the password if you are logged in as that user. Let's say that's the use case. Silly, but illustrate the concept. And the, the solution for this is using views and rules. I'm not going to cover rules. I'm going to go through this quickly. So if it piques your interest, come speak to me afterwards. Oh, quickly, quickly, quickly. Yeah. OK. We just define a utility function that raises any error. By default, it raises permission denied. Okay? Then we create a schema API. Remember, we used the core schema up to now. Create the API schema and give usage on API to our API user. Then we create a user view in API, not in core, but in API. We select the current user, just to cache it, kind of. And then we select ID and username and password from core.user. Okay? But whenever we want to evaluate this value, this expression is going to execute. So if our current user is null, uh, is not null, so if we are logged in, then we will turn, return the username. Otherwise, we need to raise an error. So you have to be logged in to see the usernames of the users. For password, if the ID for the user you're trying to access is you, then return the password. Otherwise, raise an error. Okay? Then we create an insert rule on the view. So whenever you want to insert here, instead of what you were planning to do, do this. Insert into core.user the username and, uh, and password, the, the table core.user. And whenever you want to update here, instead of what you were planning, do this instead. So you say that when you want to update the password, ensure that the user you're updating the password for is you. Then you can update that password. Otherwise, otherwise, raise an error. One minute. And then we grant select <coughs> on api.user, insert into the username and password, and update of the password, so API. And we grant usage on that um, sequence. OK, we assume the role of API. Select star from api.user, access denied. Why? Um, because the username and password columns are, are protected. We tried to evaluate a username that we didn't have access for. Let's select only the IDs. We can do that. Those aren't protected by our view. Okay, let's log in. Verify that we're logged in. 
and now select from api.user again. Well, we're logged in so we can see the usernames, but the password column is still protected, and we try to evaluate the password of user2 that gave us access. No, it can't do that. So only select the ID and the username. That's fine. Select everything where it's us. That's fine. We didn't try to e evaluate any cells that we don't have permission for, so the query succeeds. Succeeds. That's not us, so we can't evaluate the password there. Let's update the password for all users. Can't do that because we can't update the password for the user that it's, is not us. Let's update it for us. That's fine. Log out. Verify that we logged out. And insert a new user. This, this is when someone registers on your website or whatever. Okay. So you can see another user has been created with ID3 called new user. Log in as new user. Verify. We've got ID3 there. Oh, okay, well, that just illustrates the, the registration process. So what have we done? We've taken this where every request goes through some kind of access control in your application layer, hits the DB indiscriminately, and the results returned to this. You've got your user. The application layer doesn't really matter. It hits your DB directly. The DB controls access to everything on a cell-based level. I'm going to skip this because I think we're out of time. I'll, I'll just give you the summary. Basically, what I do here is I um, select a lot of stuff using row-level security and then without, and then using our custom um, cell-based security and then without to see what the performance impact is. I'll summarize it here for you. Row-level row security and our view abstraction method are both slower. We can expect that because it's more work. But the question is how much slower. So row-level security was 2.8 times in our specific case. And the view abstraction was only 1.3 times. So the takeaway here is it's slower, but it's really not that much slower. So, but if it's slower, then why do it? Security, first and foremost, foremost. Everything, all access is controlled by the DB. So even if your application code is compromised, the database will still stop that request. You can essentially give your user free form access. Doesn't matter. SQL injection, thing of the past, doesn't matter. And secondly, developer productivity. You don't have to worry about access control in each API endpoint. So even the new guy can now safely work on your applications and your APIs. So the worst thing that can happen, the API breaks, but your data is perfectly safe. Okay.